Good morning, good morning, church family. How are we feeling, everybody? Come on, how are we feeling, everybody? Are we feeling good? Uh, can I be totally honest? Uh, it is so good to see people in church. Uh, this has been, it's been a long time since I've gotten to speak on a Sunday. And uh, everybody handling uh, Corona season well? You guys managing? Um, I mean, I know it's been uh, kind of discouraging for many people. I'm going to talk about this in a little bit during the message, but uh, I'm so grateful for houses of worship like Restoration. And uh, to Pastor Ernie and Pastor D, I, I, I just want to say uh, thank you for believing in me. Um, I don't think I've said this because I think I've been here four or five times now, but you guys were a house that believed in me in my younger years as a minister. And I've gotten to preach all over the place now, and God's really gotten to elevate my voice, and it's by God's grace. But you guys were really one of the first churches to believe in me. And so I wanted to honor you and thank you. And I think that's just a testament to your pastors, by the way, is they believe in people more than sometimes the people believe in themselves. And so can we give it up for our pastors of this house? Uh, so grateful for you guys. Honestly, you mean the world to me. Uh, Pastor Ernie, I got to say, man, you're looking pretty fit right now. I'm not even going to lie, man. Come on. How many know, although he's got muscles now, his greatest muscle is his heart. Come on. I think that's your best muscle. And Pastor D, I think you are the most fashionable woman I have ever met in my life. She literally comes up to me and like, she's so hip. She's so young. She's styling and profiling. Come on, girl. So you guys got incredible passes. Can we give it up for him one more time? And then, hey, and then listen, to the worst of tea, y'all are, are crazy. Donald, you're a stud, my man. I appreciate all that you guys do. Pastor uh, Ernie was walking up on stage, and then you started drumming for him. I'm like, I want my own theme song to When I walk up on stage in my church, my gosh, y'all just a gangster church. And so uh, I love y'all to death. Again, I've been here like four or five times now, and so uh, I don't feel like this is, you know, I'm not a guest speaker. I'm family here. You guys cool with that? So can I preach like this is my church? Because really, th th really, this is my church. We got the same heart. We might have different names, but we got the same spirit. And so I really want to preach uh, today. Hey, make sure you pull out your notes. Make sure you pull out your phone. Uh, I have a few thoughts I want to give you. Uh, due to the season that we're in and kind of the chaos that we're in, um, church looks a little bit different. But how many know, although many church doors have been closed, the church is still wide open. And what we say in our church a lot of times is we're not, you know, don't social distance, physically distance, but don't social distance. You know, you need to be connected in community. You need to be connected with people. You need to be engaged with, with friendships. And, uh, you know, bad company corrupts good character, which means really, really there's a principle in there, which means who you surround yourself with. And if you don't surround yourself with people, how many know it doesn't go well? And so you need to be around community in a community of faith. And so I'm so grateful, uh, one, for y'all's leadership and for you guys uh, to open up your church doors, to be in a house of worship. There's just something about being in the house and being in the presence of God. There's just something about that. To our online community, we love y'all. Can we get up for our online community? All those that are watching online, Facebook, we love y'all so much. Uh, my name is Pastor Devin Fry. I'm a youth and young adults pastor, also the teaching pastor at Connect Church in Ashland and Framingham, Massachusetts. And uh, we're a growing church. Uh, but again, different name, but the same spirit. Our churches are connected and intertwined. I love y'all. Make sure you guys give me some fire emojis in the chat as you hear the preach going on today. Uh, but also for the people in-house right now, listen, I'm a Pentecostal at heart. So I need y'all to holler back at me. It's been a long time since we've been in church. So you hear something good, you can say amen. Come on, you can say preach. You can say that's good. You can turn to your neighbor and say that was for you for sure. <laughs> but just don't be quiet. Come on, we're a participatory church. Uh, I have a great word for you today. And uh, again, it's kind of a, a different season that we're in. And so church is going to look a little bit different. But I think what God is doing uh, genuinely in this season, what I think God is doing is he's turning church from being services to being implemented into people. And I think what God wants to do is turn not, you know, to evangelistic services. He wants to turn you into an evangelist. Did you hear me, everybody? I'm preaching right now. And so I think sometimes we get intimidated and we don't realize how easy it actually is. And here's what I want to do. Here's the title of my message today. So write this down in your notes. The heart and the habits of soul winners. The heart and the habits of soul winners. And I think what a lot of times we do is we give you strategy before we give you the spirit. Or we give you the habits before we give you the heart. 
And so I want to give you those two kind of practical things today, and I want to extract from John chapter 1. John chapter 1, uh, we're going to study a character named Andrew quickly. It says this, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said. So John the Baptist has been preparing the way. He's been preaching. He's been planting seeds in his city. So much so that people were like, are you the Savior, John? And John goes, no, I'm not the Savior. Jesus is, but he is coming. And so as Jesus is really now starting his ministry, this is what happens. So uh, one of the two heard what John has been preaching, and he had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did, everybody say Andrew. Come on, everybody say Andrew. First thing Andrew did was he found his brother, Simon, also known as Peter. We know him as Peter. He found his brother, Peter, and he told him, we have found the Messiah. Oh, man, I love that. That is the Christ. And he brought him, brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and he said, you are Simon, son of John, and you will be called Cephas, which then was translated to Peter. I want to preach from this thought, the heart and habits of soul winners. Father, we love you. We thank you, Jesus, for this opportunity we have today to be able to share your word and to preach your word. Father, we ask that our hearts, our minds would be open. Help us today to see Jesus. We need to hear from heaven, God. I pray that through the medium of technology, you would speak to your people. We genuinely believe that in moments like these, you know, maybe not everything changes, but our heart can change, and therefore everything changes externally because there was a change internally. Help us to see Jesus, to hear from heaven, and to encounter the power of God and the people of faith in this community. Said amen, and amen, and amen. Thank you, Donis. I'll call you back up in a few. Um, so I have a friend in our church, and uh, he's a great friend of mine. He actually played in the NFL. And uh, he was telling me this one particular time about these recruiters that were always recruiting him to come on and play on their team. And so he was giving me the job description of an NFL recruiter. An NFL recruiter, this is what they would do. They would scour the earth. Come on, they would go from city to city, province to province. They would go from country to country. And their responsibility, their sole responsibility was to find top-level talent that was hungry and that was humble and try and recruit them onto their team. And to me, as he was communicating this, I thought to myself, this sounds a whole lot like the Christian faith. Is that we are in our responsibility that God gives each and every single one of us is to scour the earth from go to city to city, walk from place to place, go from town to town, region to region, and to recruit people, not just to get into the house of God, but to play on Jesus' team. Can I get an amen from somebody? This is the responsibility of all Christians. This is the responsibility of all believers. And friends, this is the responsibility of soul winners. See, because in Proverbs chapter 11, I believe it's up on the screen or it'll be up on the screen in a moment. The Bible says it like this. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life. But he who wins souls, come on, what does it say? Is wise. He who wins souls is wise. Come on, how many in here want to be a soul winner? How many want to be used by God? I want to be a soul winner. I want to be used by God. But to be completely honest with you, and this is where I think the church has done a poor job, not this church in particular, but I'm saying the church globally, I think we've done a poor job on training people how to properly win souls. And to be completely honest with you, totally transparent, this is how I do ministry. Um, to be totally transparent, I really struggled with this for a long time. Uh, I always wanted to be a soul winner. I always wanted to help people. I always wanted to evangelize. I always wanted to share the gospel message. I remember hearing my friends, they would win their entire football team to Christ. And I remember thinking to myself, I want to be that. But there was always something in the way. Anybody know what I'm talking about right now? I felt stuck. I felt scared. I actually really felt like I was super selfish. I cared way too much about what people thought about me. And I cared way too much about, you know, kind of the feelings that I felt. I didn't want to be associated as weird. I didn't want to be a, a, you know, a Christian freak or a Jesus freak kind of guy. But then I realized how important this message is. And it is the hope for humanity. Can I get an amen? It's the hope for humanity. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to be a soul winner. But there was just something in the way. There was something blocking my path. And I needed to study how soul winners did it. Now, let me tell you a story real quick. There's this young man. His name was Grady Wilson. Everybody say Grady Wilson. So there's this young man named Grady Wilson, and he was a baseball player. So as a baseball player, he brought a couple of his friends to church. He heard about this crusade, 
uh, that was going on in his city in North Carolina. And so he grabs one of his friends. His, his friend was named Billy. And he grabs Billy and he draws them to this tent revival meeting. Now, there was this man named Dr. Mordecai Ham that was preaching. Dr. Mordecai Ham was preaching on the repentance and the kingdom of God and how it's near. And how you have to give your life to Christ. And I'm telling you, God will give you a radical and transformed life. And he was preaching and he was speaking. And these two young men, Grady Wilson and, and Billy, walk up to the altar. As uh, Dr. Mordecai Ham was giving this sermon and giving this message, they walk up to the altar and they give their lives to Christ. Now, Grady recommitted his life to Christ, but he brought his friend to Christ and he brought him to the altar. And his name was Billy Graham. This is who Billy Graham is today. One of the greatest evangelists, if not arguably the greatest American evangelist on the planet, him, Reinhard Bunke, incredible leaders, incredible evangelists. But this is how Billy Graham got saved is because there was one young man whose name was Grady Wilson, and he brought him to the altar and he brought him to Jesus. Now, you've heard of Billy Graham, but you haven't heard of Grady Wilson. See, many people here. Here's the deal. Uh, we would not have Billy if we did not have Grady. Now, this is the text that we read earlier. The text that we read earlier was John chapter 1, where Andrew brings Peter to Christ. Is that not what we read? Come on, talk back to me, everybody. So we see that, we see that Andrew brings Peter to Christ. And we all know Peter. Why? Because Peter has two books of the Bible written in it, Pastor Ernie. He has two written books of the Bible, First and Second Peter. Does Andrew have a book of the Bible? No, he does not have a book of the Bible. Anytime we see Andrew, and we don't see Andrew that often, but anytime we see Andrew in Scripture, we find him three different times. He's bringing his brother to Jesus, he's bringing the Greeks to Jesus, and he's also bringing the fish and two loaves to Jesus. And so Andrew in Scripture is known solely for one thing, bringing people and possessions to Jesus. Come on, anybody in here want to be known for bringing things, bringing people to Jesus? I want to be known for that. But listen, Andrew doesn't get a book of the Bible written about him. Andrew doesn't get a ton of recognition. Peter does. We know Peter is super famous. Peter is known for his impulsive behaviors. Peter is known for his personality. Peter is known for preaching the gospel, and 3,000 people give their lives to Christ in one particular day. Peter is known for cutting off the Roman guard's ears. Peter is known for denying Christ. We know all about Peter, but we know little about Andrew. And listen to me. Here's, here's a key thought I want you to remember today, and write this down in your notes is this, Andrew doesn't have a recorded sermon in Scripture because Andrew was the sermon in Scripture. Oh, my God. Did you hear what I just said? Andrew doesn't have a recorded sermon in Scripture because Andrew was the sermon in Scripture. And listen to me. You may not have a ton of sermons that you preach in your life, but, friend, you are the sermon in this city that needs to be preached. You can preach, listen to me, without preaching. And we need some people that are raised up, come on, in this community, in this church, in this city, come on, Providence in Rhode Island. They need soul winners to be raised up in our churches. And right now, I think, and I tell you, this is the heart of God, and this is the heart of God certainly for our church, and I believe it's for yours. God wants to raise up some soul winners in this house. And listen, when the day comes... When the doors can be open again and they can be flung wide open again, I am telling you, because we are being mobilized right now, because we are being empowered right now, the church will see its greatest days and we will see a harvest like never before in Jesus' name. Why? Because God is raising up leaders. He is raising up soul winners. This is what God is doing, I believe, in our cities, in our communities, and in this house is God wants to raise up some soul winners. Come on. Anybody here want to, want to become a soul winner? I want to become a soul winner. I'm talking to you two online. We got to become soul winners to reach our city. And how can you do this? I want to give you two different things. I want to give you, first of all, the heart of soul winners. And then the second part, I want to give you the habits. And it's really simple. It's really easy. I worked hard on this message just to make sure it's simplified so you can remember it and you can walk away, put it in your pocket. Here's a strategy. But first, you get, before you get the strategy, you need to get the spirit. Here's the first thing about soul winners. If you ripped open their heart, if you got to see inside of their heart, what would you find inside a soul winner? The first thing I think you would find inside the heart of a soul winner is it would have fractures. Somebody say fractures. It would have fractures. What does this mean? It simply means this. Uh, their hearts are broken. Their hearts are fragmented. Uh, can I just ask a simple question? How long are you going to go through life looking at the brokenness of humanity and not be moved with compassion? Have we, read, have we read some of the scriptures of Jesus? See, Jesus, it says it like this. He saw the crowd, and what happened? He saw the crowd, and he was so moved with compassion. 
I don't, I don't need to go through a whole lot of stories. I don't need to go through a litany of different stories that you're experiencing. Because right now, honestly, in coronavirus season, in COVID season, during this pandemic, people have been going through hell on earth. Am I talking to anybody in the room today? People have been going through hell on earth. They have lost jobs. They have lost family. They have lost hope. They have lost loved ones. People are going through hell on earth. And I think it's what God is trying to do in our cities and in our communities and in our churches is he's trying to raise up some people that are just so moved with compassion. So moved with compassion, man. Like, I'll give you a couple stories. There's a young man. I've actually brought him here when I've preached. Two times ago when I preached here, I brought him here. Uh, I believe he came up on stage and he shared a quick little word of encouragement. Uh, since that moment really on, uh, he's been in and out of mental hospitals. He's been in and out of the psych ward, uh, struggling with bipolar disorder, incredibly depressed, uh, hears demons, like the whole nine. And his family's been torn apart and ripped apart. And this is like my little brother. He's one of my students. Um, my family, my, my immediate family right now is going through a lot. My brother-in-law really struggling, not doing so well, uh, in and out of uh, rehab. Um, I think there's just this season has been expedited and has really accelerated pain in people's lives. And I know you have your stories. Come on, I'm talking to you guys. I know you have your stories, and I know the people that you have been surrounded by. And listen, be moved with compassion. We have to be asking God, God, would you break our hearts for what breaks yours? See, listen, this is what I teach some of my young people, is you don't need more boldness. You need more compassion. Because compassion is the root, and boldness is the fruit. See, I believe a spirit of boldness can come upon you to be a soul winner, to share your faith, to share the gospel message. I think that's so important. But really, the root behind boldness is the fact that you are so moved by compassion, just like Jesus was. And if you are moved with compassion, boldness is naturally just going to happen and occur. And so if you want to become a soul winner, come on, how many in here want to become a soul winner? If you want to become a soul winner, you must be moved with compassion. Jesus later goes on to say it like this. He says, they are like sheep without a shepherd. And so you have to see this. Like, what, like, can we just ask a simple question? What do people do without God in this time? Are you kidding me? Like, some people are like, yeah, uh, you know, we go to, you have religion, you have God because it's a crutch for you. I'm like, yeah, it is. Why? Because we need, we're weak people. We need help. We're sinners in in need of a savior. I have a miracle working God on my side. He is a healer. He is a redeemer. This is the God that we serve, everybody. Everybody. We must be moved with compassion. They are like sheep without a shepherd. What do people do when they don't have God? Another thing, another question is, what do people do when they don't have a church? Friend, do you know how many people come in and out of church, and we call them frequent flyers in our house. They come in and out of church. They're not engaged. They're not connected. They don't have community. don't have a pastor. Their, their soul is not, they don't have anybody responsible for their soul. What do people do in times like these? Are you kidding me? Like, that's why I'm so grateful for churches like this. That's why I'm so grateful for our church. That's why I'm so grateful for for great leaders is because your soul can find rest because not only does it know God, it also has community. It also has a pastor. It also has a shepherd. It also can come in and worship God together. This is why what we do matters. The heart of a soul winner sees differently. Their eyes are trained. Their eyes are advanced. Their heart, listen to me, is fractured. Here's the second thing. If you looked inside the heart of a soul winner, I think you would find fractures. I think the second thing would be this. You would find fear. Somebody say fear. Now, now this doesn't make sense, Devin. What are you talking about? Because we know that God does not give a spirit of fear, but of boldness, power, love, a sound mind. This is what God does. He doesn't give us a spirit of fear, but it's a different type of fear. See, soul winners, the sole motivation for soul winners are two things. It is the fear of God. And we don't talk about this enough. In culture today. It's the fear of God. Come on. People do. This is a scripture in Judges. Uh, they wandered off and they did whatever they wanted in their own eyes because they had no king. That's the theme scripture in all of Judges. So people did what they wanted because they had no king. We need a fear of God, a healthy fear of God established and injected back into our churches again. And you know what? Here's the deal. And I'm just being a good pastor and I'm appreciative of a platform and trust Pastor Ernie to say this. And I'm going to handle it carefully. 
um, one day, listen to me, you will give an account for your life. And you will stand before the almighty God. And you know what? Pastor Ernie, Pastor D are not going to be there with you. Mom, dad, they're not going to be there with you. Friend, brother, your wife, your husband, they are not going to be there with you. You will stand before God one day, face to face, eye to eye, right on his throne. And you have to give an account for your life. And so that that belief, that truth, that information alone changed my life because I realized that I have to give an account not to humanity. I don't have to give an account to other people. I give an account to Almighty God, and I stand before him, and I want to make my God proud. Is there anybody else in this church that wants to make God proud, and you want to hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Come on, can I get anybody in here to clap their hands and to praise God right now and to say, that is what I want for my life. Soul winners know this. They have a healthy fear of God. And here's the second thing, and this is not easy to preach, but it's necessary. They have a fear of God, but they also have a fear of hell. How many know heaven and hell are realities? And so based on what we do here today, based on what we do in our community, will determine whether people spend eternity separated from God or with God. Soul winners know what, my, what I am doing, every key that I play, every drum that I bang, every time I greet people at the door, every time I preach a sermon, every time I give a dollar, every time I'm serving on the camera, every time we do this is because heaven and hell are realities. And this is our mission is to empty hell and to populate heaven. This is who we are and this is what we do and this is the heart of soul winning. I'm preaching right now, somebody. I feel the Holy Ghost in this room. This is the heart of soul winners, is we empty hell and we populate heaven. And if you looked inside the heart of soul winners, you would see it's fractured. You would see that there's fear. But here's the last thing I think you would see inside of the heart of a soul winner is there is fire. Oh, my gosh. Can I get the keys come up, brother? I need need to sound extra spiritual right now. You would see that there is fractures, there is fear, but then there is also, there's fire. Come on, anybody feel like you got a fire on the inside of your soul that you just cannot help but speak about what you have seen and what you have heard? Come on, has God been good to anybody in this room? Have you ever seen miracles happen in your life? Have you ever been healed from sickness? Has God ever redeemed you from the pit? Have God ever redeemed you from the miry clay? Has he ever helped you in circumstances when it was impossible, but you realize that impossible is God's job description? I want to let you know, I have seen some crazy stuff. I have done some crazy stuff, and I have seen God be good in my life, and he has redeemed me, set me free, saved me, freed my soul and now I have to let this passion out of my heart because God has been that good has he been that good to anybody else in this place come on would you clap your hands and would you praise almighty God right now I'm talking to you online throw some fire emojis in the chat right now because we need to know soul winners they got fractures they got fear but they also got fired there's a scripture in Jeremiah 20 it says it like this It says, like a fire shut up in my bones. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. Here's what it says. It says right up here. Throw it up on the screen, guys. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is like a fire in my heart. It's like a fire shut up in my bones. I'm weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. It's a fire shut up in my bones. It's the heart of a soul My prayer at the end of this sermon, because I want to give you three little habits quickly. It's going to be fast. Three habits of a soul winner. How do you win souls? Because you can't have the habits if you don't have the heart. And so my prayer at the end of this is found in Ezekiel. God says, I want to give you a new heart. I want to give you a new spirit. And I want to turn your heart of stone into a heart of flesh. Anybody want that today? Come on, anybody want that today? Turn a heart of stone into a heart of flesh. So... The heart of a soul winner, if you study them, if you looked at Andrew, Peter, John, if you looked at John the Baptist, if you look inside of, honestly, Devin Fry, this is my passion. This is my mission. This is the heart, I believe, of this house. If you looked inside the heart of a soul winner, when you see it's fractured, you would see that there's the fear of God and a fear of hell. You would see that there is a fire shut up in their bones. We cannot stop talking about what we have seen and what we have heard. This is who we are. It's soul winners. But here's the habits of soul winners. Ready? Three things. Super practical. Write these three things down. I'm going to say them real quick. 
Soul winners do. This is the habits of what soul winners do. They pray, they plant, and they preach. Come on, say it with me. Say pray. Come on, say it with me. Pray, they plant, and they preach. One more time. They pray, they plant, and they preach. One more time. They pray, they plant, and they preach. We pray, we plant, and we preach. Listen to me. Soul winners know this. Soul winners know we don't save anybody. Did you hear what I just said, church family? Soul winners know we don't save a soul. You don't have the ability to save your own soul. You can't save anybody else. Come on, we know we can't save anybody, but we can serve everybody. Soul winners don't do the converting. We do the conversing. Soul winners know we don't save anybody. We can't fix anybody. We can't change anybody. We can't force anybody. But we can point people to the one who can change them, to the one who can save them, to the one that can give them hope, to the one that can give them a future, the one that can give them dreams and imaginations bigger than they can even think. This is what soul winners do. We don't save anybody, but we can serve anybody and everybody in our path. This is the heart of a soul winner. We pray. I'm thinking about this experience I had in Florida when I was in Bible college. I was just telling my team this yesterday. And uh, I'm living in Bradenton, Florida. And where Bradenton, Florida is, is the plant uh, where Tropicana, the orange juice company, is. And so occasionally, all throughout the city, there would be these trucks that drive up and down, uh, you know, the city. And so you would see tens of thousands of oranges in each of these trucks. And so when the plant would squeeze and press all the oranges the entire city would have this beautiful citrusy orange juice aroma through the whole city just because the one plant was just pressing and this one plant was uh, spreading all these oranges throughout it you know what prayer does prayer releases this beautiful aroma come on help me preach right now everybody prayer releases this beautiful this this aroma that washes it makes you thirsty oh my gosh it makes you thirsty so this is what prayer does this is what worship does this is what soul winners do it releases this beautiful aroma this smell you can actually taste it in the air where there's just the presence of God released into the whole city and because we pray and because we worship and because we give and because we tithe and because we invite and because we serve I'm telling you the presence of God doesn't just stay in this building the presence of God goes into your house the presence of God goes into your work the presence of God goes into every space and place that you occupy that is what prayer does and we plant. The Bible says very clearly, Paul says it like this. He says, he says, I planted the seed. Apollos watered the seed. But God is the one that makes it grow. And so, friend, you want to, how many, how many in here, by a show of hands, and same thing with you, Chad. How many in here have some people in their lives that you want to see one to Christ? Would you raise your hands? Everybody has it. Listen, take the pressure off. You can't save them. You are not their savior. All you can do, plant seeds, plant seeds, plant seeds, plant seeds, and plant seeds. What do you do? It's a word of encouragement. It's some hope. It's a financial contribution. Do whatever you can. Plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds until eventually you see that thing grow. And maybe you're not the one that's, that waters it, but you are not the one that ever grows it. God is the one that grows it. And we can't tell when the time is of when that seed is going to grow, but we can plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds and plant seeds. Somebody say we pray. We pray, we plant, and then we, we what? We pray. We pray, we plant, and we preach. We pray, we plant, and we preach. We plant seeds. Frank, can I tell you, there was this one young man um, for 10 to 11 years. I played basketball with him in high school. I've been out of high school for 10 years. Um, we played basketball for years. I used to look up to him. But my family and I, we just decided, you know what, this family, the Hanrahan family, we're not giving up on them. They are, honestly, to be completely totally honest with you, they were known as notorious sinners in our, in our community. But we were like, he's a leader. This man is a leader. And so we just planted seeds, we planted seeds, and we planted seeds to the point where we're like, I don't know if it's really going to work. Mom, dad did it. I did it when I was his teammate. Uh, my sisters did it because she, they were friends with uh, 
his brother. And we just planted seeds, and we planted seeds, and we planted seeds. And you know what happened one day? I'm preaching in Sunday service. I get a text. I get a DM in the morning. I get a DM on Instagram, and it was my friend. His name was Ryan. Ryan hits me up, and he says, Dev, uh, I've been through a lot, made a lot of mistakes. Can I come to church? Is that allowed? And I go, no, you have to tithe first. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. I said, of course, bro. And as a matter of fact, I'm preaching today, and I would love to have you come. He comes to church, and you know what the message I preached was? This is how divine God is, by the way. I preached this message. It was called, I Messed Up. And it was all about when people make mistakes. Galatians 6.1, you are supposed to gently restore people. God, in his sovereignty, we planted seeds for 10, 11, 12 years And in his sovereignty, the one Sunday, my friend Ryan decides to show up to church. He walks into church, and the whole sermon was just saying, you might have made a mistake, but you're not a mistake. You might have committed some failures, but you are not a failure. And God has a plan for you. He has a purpose for you. You know what my friend did? He came up to me right after service that day. He goes, I can't believe this is what you're talking about. I know you've been trying to invite me for years. I'm verbatim repeating what he said. I know you've been trying to invite me for years to come to this church. And the one Sunday I come, you're talking about this, and it's you speaking. And I said, he, and he literally goes, it's almost like he, he doesn't know God yet. It's honestly like, you know, the big guy up there is trying to speak to me. That's exactly what he said. And I said, Ryan, you know what? He is. Because what do you do? You plant, and you plant, and you plant, and you sow seed, and you sow seed, and you sow seed, until one day, God makes it grow. One day, God made it grow. You know what happened? Two weeks later, my friend Ryan gave his life to Christ. He came into church, and he says, Dev, I'm ready. He texts me during the pandemic, and he goes, Dev, uh, when is church opening back up again? Because I'm dying to go back. I, I, need, I, need, I need more God in my life. I need to be in church again. That's what happens when you pray and you plant. And lastly, you preach. Come on, don't make me preach right now. You preach. Is this helping anybody in here? Worship team, can you guys come on up here? We'll just kind of minister a little bit at the very end. How am I doing on time, Pastor? Is it okay? Okay, I think I see a few more minutes remaining. But you preach. Here's the deal. Some of you guys don't know how to preach or preach a sermon. That's okay. Here are three things I wrote down. Here's what you preach. Is you share, number one, your stuff. Watch. We talk about, the scripture says, I believe it's in Corinthians, it says, you boast about your weaknesses because in your weaknesses, God really makes you strong. He perfects your weaknesses. He helps you with it. So share your stuff. Meaning, you don't have to be fake anymore. Come on. How many know being fake is exhausting? Thinking like you can't show, like, I am imperfect. Listen, I'm a preacher. I'm a pastor. Sometimes people put you on a pedestal because there's a stage separating you and I. I am a human being. I have flaws. Ask my wife. She knows I got some flaws. (laughs) She's nodding her head right now. Baby, you're supposed to encourage me right now. Uh, But share your stuff. Just tell people, like, Yo, I remember who I used to be. Come on, anybody remember where, who they used to be before it was God coming into their life? I remember who I used to be. I was, I was angry. I was depressed. I was empty. I barely graduated school. I didn't have many options to go. And nowadays, this is how funny God is. And I bet you there's some testimonies in this room right now. I bet you there's some testimonies that are watching online right now where you remember who you used to be and God has redeemed it and flipped it up completely where now I barely graduated school and now I'm a teacher at a leadership academy and a leadership college and I speak all around the uh, east coast this is how good God is this is not how good I am this is how good God is is he can change and transform any story and any testimony share your stuff number two is share your story let people know what God has done in your life Come on, God's been good to all of us. God's been good to all of us. Can I get an amen, church family? God's been good to all of us. He's been so good. Just share your stuff. Share your story. And then lastly, share your Savior. Come on, there's there's no name like the name of Jesus. It's the sweetest name that has ever existed. It is the bridge between heaven and hell. It is the bridge between heaven and earth. This is... This is the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess. 
Come on, one day every knee will bow that Jesus is Lord. There is power in the name of Jesus. Darkness trembles at the name of Jesus. Demons shudder at the name of Jesus. Share your Savior. I remember hearing one of my mentors tell me this. And I pray you remember this. I pray this is a phrase that you remember in your spirit for the rest of your life. If you make much of Jesus, Jesus will make much of you. Did you hear what I said, everybody? If you make much of Jesus, Jesus will make much of you. I'll finish with this last story because it's the heart and the habits of soul winners. Is this. Uh, my wife and I, we've been married for four and a half years now. We have a second baby boy on the way right now. And uh, we have our firstborn son. His name is Zion, Zion Joshua. Our second born, we about two and a half months away, babe, three months, three months left until we uh, pop out our, our second boy. Really, until she pops out our second boy. Come on, we're pregnant too. Um, his name is going to be Ezra James. It's going to be so, so handsome, so strong. So Zion Joshua, Ezra James. But Zion and I uh, and my wife, we were hanging out one Saturday morning. And we were just hanging around the house. It's during the pandemic. And we just like, we just want to get out of the house first and foremost. I have a key to our church. And so I was like, babe, why don't we go to the church? Let's go play in the kids' world. Because we want to make sure that Zion remembers like what the church is. You know, we want him to play in the church. We have, There's a ton of toys over there. So we can just go there, hang out for a little bit, do that. So we get him in the car. And that's like, that's a great idea. Let's go drive. So we drive off to the church. And as soon as we pull into the parking lot, I go, Zion, look. Look, look where we're at. We're at church. And he sees the church building. And he screams. He goes, Home. The first thing this young man said, he hasn't seen this church building in months. And the first thing he says when he sees the building, he goes, home. Friend, this is the heart of every soul winner. Is all we want to do is bring people home. All we want to do is bring people into the loving arms of their heavenly father. All we want to do is not just bring them to heaven, but it's also we want to bring people to live heaven on earth. We don't have to just wait until eternity. We can bring people to eternity right now, and eternity can start for you. If you're watching online, eternity can start for you today. Eternity can start for you today. It does not have to wait until you die and ascend to heaven. Eternity and the abundant life that God promises in John 10, 10 can start today. And this is the heart of every single soul winner. Is our goal, our habit, our mission, our hope is to bring people home. 